Welcome back to Applied Mathematics. In this video, I want to talk about SI prefixes. And I was supposed to appear over here, sorry about that, so that you could see what was behind me, a list of some of the SI prefixes I plan to talk about. We have talked about kilo and milli previously, although I didn't use uh, scientific notation as a way of expressing them. We talked about centi, which actually doesn't make the list. Um, the other ones, the bigger ones, we have not talked about. If you've ever done any work with computer architecture, you should be very familiar with mega, giga, and tera. Looking smaller than milli, you have micro. Uh, if you do precision machining in SI units, the micrometer or micrometer is very useful there. Smaller than that is nano. Uh, the nanometer is very useful in describing the wavelengths of light. And smaller than that is pico, which I don't know any applications for. There are even bigger and even smaller SI prefixes. Uh, bigger than tera is exa. It goes up to 10 to the 27 and 10, down to 10 to the negative 27, just in increments of three each way. And as we find more applications for bigger numbers, and as we find more applications for smaller numbers, we keep inventing new ones. As a general rule of thumb, kilo breaks the mold, but for SI prefixes that are bigger than 10 to the three, we use a capital letter. And a lowercase letter is a negative prefix. Micro, again, the weird one, we already used M for milli, and we wanted another M, so we used the Greek letter that looks mostly like M, or that sounds like M. Most people say it looks closer to a U, but the uh, Greek letter mu here is supposed to be a stylized script M looking thing. Let me get my head out of the way and do my best to draw a very nice looking mu, very large. And if you look at it like that, you can start to see that, yes, that is a script M. All right, baseline is here and everything is hanging under the baseline. But this is not a penmanship course, so we'll stop at that. All right. Very often at this point, uh, courses and textbooks start breaking into a whole bunch of interesting rules and interesting ways of learning these and converting between them. And I am going to, as I have a couple of times this semester already, shortcut all of that by telling you to turn to a calculator. Specifically, I am going to use a feature available on most scientific calculators called engineering notation. So, no, not me, my calculator. Let's get my calculator on the screen here so that we can talk about this. All right, the first thing I want to do is just get a number on here that is in scientific notation. So there we go, there's a number in scientific notation. And again, M menuing varies from calculator to calculator, but on my calculator I have a mode button up here. And I've got the first row of this is talking about different ways of representing angles. That is not what I am looking for. The second row here gives me norm, a normal mode, psi, scientific notation always no matter what, and ENG for engineering notation. That's the one I want. All right. Second, quit to get out of there. And if I hit enter again to bring my value back on the screen, you can see that it's the same value, but slightly different. The decimal point moved over one place. And that's kind of the hallmark of engineering notation. Engineering notation works the same as scientific notation, but instead of having exactly one digit before the decimal point, we have one, two, 
or three digits before the decimal point. And we have that the exponent is always a multiple of three. And exponent is a multiple of three is exactly the pattern that I just told you shows up for all of the very large and very small SI prefixes. So if we are trying to do calculations and we want the value to end up using an SI prefix, then we're going to go ahead and do that calculation using engineering notation. I can go back into the mode on my calculator, take that back to normal mode, and now it's going to show me that in scientific notation again. And I just want to show you this really quickly. Uh, for any Texas Instruments calculator, if you're doing things in the menu and things suddenly stop working somewhere in a weird place, if you hold the on and clear buttons at the same time, it will reset the memory to the default settings for the calculator. And I cannot tell you the number of times that I have in the middle of an exam realized that things were going very strangely and not known what happened and just gone ahead and reset my calculator and everything worked fine again. All right, that's that particular shortcut works for just about every Texas Instruments calculator. Other brands, you have to do things differently. All right, but I'm going to go ahead and get my calculator back into engineering notation because that's what I'm going to need for some of the calculations we want to do today. Let me, for now though, get the calculator off of the screen. And let's do some arithmetic. I want to take and add a couple of measured values. I'm going to add 3.75 micrometers plus 278.9 nanometers. I know from that list of SI prefixes that a micrometer is times 10 to the negative 6 meters and a nanometer is times 10 to the negative 9 meters. And since my calculator is in engineering notation, if I go ahead and I type this expression in, 3.75 times 10 to the negative 6 plus 278.9 times 10 to the negative 9, my calculator will keep things in engineering notation for us, and it will tell me that the solution here is 4.0289 times 10 to the negative 6. Units will still be in meters, and 10 to the negative 6 is micrometers. But probably I shouldn't have written that out yet because I still have to figure out where to round. Well, where to round in engineering notation, I'll use the same trick as in scientific notation. If that's my 10 to the negative 6 term, then that's my 10 to the negative 7 term, and that's my 10 to the negative 8 term. If that's my 10 to the negative 9, well then this is going to be 10 to the negative 8, and this is going to be 10 to the negative 7. And that over there will be 10 to the negative 10, but 10 to the negative 8 is definitely the worst precision. So negative 6, negative 7, negative 8, that's where I want to round it, and I will call my result in this case 4.03 micrometers.
things get a little bit more interesting when I have some multiplication that has to happen. Um, let's just go ahead and take a look at an exact or a uh, unitless quantity. How about um, 4 times pi squared multiplied by something that is given as a SI measurement. Two hundred seventy eight kilograms. All right, two hundred seventy eight kilograms is two hundred seventy eight times ten to the third grams. All right, four looks like an exact value. Pi, if I use the pi button on my calculator, is close enough to an exact value that I don't have to worry about it. So I'll type in 4 times pi squared times 278 times 10 to the third power. And since the only approximate value is the 278, which has three significant digits, I know that this measurement also has three significant digits. Uh, 10.97, etc. But rounding that to three significant digits is actually going to be 11.0 times 10 to the 6 grams, which is 11.0 11 megagrams. Is that useful? That varies drastically from application to application. Sometimes it would be more useful to call this 11,000 kilograms than to call it anything in megagrams. One of the nice things about choosing to do things this way, though, is it makes it very clear very immediately that that zero is a significant zero. If you had this in kilograms, it would be 11,000. And you'd have to mark in that that zero is significant. So one of the reasons that all of these SI prefixes exist is to give us a way of more clearly denoting which zeros are and are not significant. All right, I think that that's probably good enough for this video. I'll wrap up with that. As always, thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time.